Live from Jerber, this is the Lock Tomb Podcast. I'm Amy. And I'm Mel. Today we'll be covering Gideon the Ninth, chapters 23 through 27. In this section, we get to see Camilla the Sixth in action, which is totally awesome. Unfortunately, we also see the fourth die, which sucks. The sixth and the ninth start working together more closely, and Harrow and Gideon get in a huge fight over a girl, which is so gay. <laughs> <laughs> Before we get started, Amy, I'm curious if you know what the ninth house calls the day after today. Oh, no. What? Tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't my best work. <laughs> I should have been able to guess that one. Yeah, I came up with that today on a walk. Wow, congratulations. You know, that was as advanced as I could get today. <laughs> Thanks, Magnus. <laughs> All right, Magnus. <laughs> uh, rip. Miss you already. Uh, all right, let's jump on in. Chapter 23. So last we saw these guys, they'd figured out that there was a dead body in the incinerator. So in this bit, they all gather to talk about it. And it turns out that Ianthe notices that it's actually two people and that they would have died at the same time because the time signature is the same on both of them. This is a little bit confusing because when Ianthe says the time signature is three months old and Pal says you're out by about eight weeks, which would still predate us significantly, I don't really understand this because that would mean that they died about a month ago, but he says it predates us significantly. And I thought that Kitharea killed Dulcinea and Protessa Lawis on the shuttle. She did. But when the ninth was on their shuttle, it took a couple hours. And so I don't understand the timeline now. They get on the shuttle. She kills Dulcinea and Protessa Lawis, and presumably they would then show up at or at the first house within a couple hours of them dying. Well, what was your what's your theory on which planet the seventh house is? Venus. So significantly closer to the first than the ninth. Right. If the theory holds. I mean, maybe their orbit was like in a, totally around the sun. You know, like maybe their orbit mm. was on the other side of of the sun. You know. Ooh, I never thought so about that. So that's like one. I mean, it is like kind of a funny little nitpicky thing for you to pick up on. <laughs> I love that. I know. <laughs> but, um, but no, Kitharea confirms later on that she killed... Protessa Lawis in the shuttle, mm -hmm. then chatted with Dulcinea for a while, and then killed her. Okay. So when her and Sextus are having their like little chat before Sextus attempts to kill her, when he asks Kitharea like where she is, Kitharea explains all of this. Mm -hmm. But I'm just wondering how Kitharea got Dulcinea's body from the shuttle to her rooms, because. The shuttles also were pushed off the edge of the cliff. Yeah. And when they came out and saw everyone, it was Kitharea and Protessa Lawis. So arguably, Dulcinea's body would have been in the shuttle. So how how did she manage that is more of the question for me. Honestly, I bet that she just walked out and got it. I don't think any of the bone servants or like teacher or any of them would have stopped her. The only issue would be the other houses seeing her. Right. But right, she could have literally just gone, got the instructions, and then like gone back out and got the body. Bodies. Yeah. I don't know though. Yeah. But in any case, she kept the dead Dulcinea in her rooms with her. So creepy. Yeah, real weird. <laughs> but in any case, we know that it's both Protessa Lawis and the real Dulcinea who are in the incinerator. Yes. And we know that there's some suspicions here around who these people are because nobody realizes that they had died before they got there. Right. And so it throws everyone off. No one else. Well, actually, Harrow knows. Harrow's the one, Harrow's the one that, you know, got killed, the already dead, Protessa Lawis. Yeah. <laughs> and she must have suspicions that... Dulcinea is not who she says she is. Well, she, yeah, she's a smart girl. Anyway, so that's what they're talking about. And then somehow 
they start to talk about the keys because Silas takes Dulcinea's keys. Not takes, she gives them to him. I don't really understand why. Is she just trying to cause strife? You know what I mean? Like, why would Kitharea give Silas her keys? So I have two two thoughts about that. The one is that, you know, later on when Silas is talking to Gideon, Silas says that he's no longer interested in becoming a lictor. Mm -hmm. And so it could be that he's communicated that to Kitharea and Kitharea sees no problem with giving Silas her keys Mm -hmm. to keep them from anyone else if she truly believes that Silas doesn't want to go through with becoming a lictor. That's a Mm -hmm. little bit of a far-fetched theory, but that's one. And then the other is just that She's at a point where she's slowly knocking everyone off and at at this point maybe doesn't feel that anyone is going to actually ascend, that she'll eventually kill them all in time. Yeah. But I don't know. It's it's odd. Eh, Who knows? Her motivations like through this whole book, I'm a little bit confused by. We can talk about this more in a little bit. Anyway, we'll get to it. But then we get to the Camilla Marta duel which basically happens because the second gets like super obnoxious and like acts like they're trying to help everyone, but actually they just end up blowing the whole thing open by challenging the sixth to their keys. And they expect the sixth to default because the six are not known for being fighters. But as we know, and as Gideon has seen, Camilla is a fierce ass bitch. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Palamides and Camilla and Gideon know this and no one else. (laughs) And I think Judith says something like, let her have her dignity or honor or something. And Palamides is like, oh, I am, which is sweet. Yeah, it's really cute. I just, I love um... (laughs) Palamides. Palamides. (laughs) Palamides. I love Palamides and Camilla's relationship. It's like, one of the better ones between mm-hmm. Cavalier and Necromancer. Yeah. Also, the way that this fight is written, this duel, is really good. Mm-hmm. And it illustrates so well what a badass Camilla is. Yeah. It's a really beautiful written duel. Usually when I read fights in books, I kind of gloss over them. Me too. I don't really care. But I actually mm-hmm. really enjoyed reading this. I thought it was really beautifully done. Yeah, I totally agree. There's also that one line that is so good where Cam is like, tell me how to play it. And Palamides doesn't immediately respond, but right before the duel starts, he says, Cam, go loud, which is awesome. He's just telling her to like make it big, really mess up the second. Totally. I mean, also, she has to show that they're not to be fucked with. Oh, yeah. Because it's getting real now, Mm -hmm. and people are playing dirty, and the six needs to show that they're not just a bunch of nerds. Right. So Camilla handily wins this fight, but is injured in the process. Marta is, like, pretty badly injured. Her arm is broken, right? Yeah. It's pretty brutal. And as they're kind of recovering, Nibiria's turn of the third house challenges the sixth house to a duel like immediately after <laughs> Ugh, and, and it's like of course yeah the third does that it's so on brand <laughs> I know. so that moves us into chapter 24 and that starts with this weird the third's dynamics are super weird so basically nabirius offers this challenge corona beth is like you're no you're not and then Ianthe is like, yes, he is. And they have this little... Yes, he is. <laughs> I know. That's so, so creepy. <laughs> um, yeah, so Corona Beth and Ianthe have this little standoff. And Ianthe totally wins. And she wins pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. And we know now why. Because Corona really has no power at all. Right. She's a commanding presence but people also think that she is a necromancer and she's not 
Mm -hmm. And her sister is actually an incredibly powerful necromancer. Yeah. And Corona is just at Ianthi's mercy. Mm -hmm. Also, you know, if we're going to unpack it a little bit, really looks up to Ianthi. You know, Ianthi is the smart necromancer. Mm -hmm. And Corona just wants her approval. And you kind of see that play out in different ways throughout these two books. But they have this really weird power dynamic between the two of them. Right. And it's clear that Nibirius really resents Ianthi for having that power over Corona. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely seems like, although he has issues with both of them, he he hates Ianthi. I am so excited to see the inevitable showdown between Corona Beth and Ianthe. Mm. There's going to be some sort of showdown. I can't wait. You hope. Do you think there's going to be a showdown? Because it could also be that Corona Beth turns on Blood of Eden and sides with Ianthe. I mean, because Cor- she could just fall right back into this pattern of doing whatever Ianthe says. Yeah. By showdown, I mean literally like their eventual, they're going to have something. It might be a fight. It might be and they like convincing Corona Beth to like come to their side. Like it could be like a weird thing where at the last minute, and they like saves Corona. You know, like it could be <laughs> literally anything. Yeah. But yeah. it's gonna happen. There's gonna be a choice mm-hmm. point, no doubt. Someone is gonna have to make a choice between their sister and something, either God or Harrow or the greater good, mm-hmm. and someone will make. A really terrible choice. Yeah. Because the third only makes terrible choices. This is true. (laughs) Pretty much exclusively. (laughs) But yeah, so weird sister dynamics here. And what I love about what happens next, this isn't just another great Gideon Harrow moment where Gideon unsheathes her sword Mm -hmm. and basically wills Harrow to step in and call for her. Gideon wants to basically step in for Camilla, so Camilla doesn't have to fight Nibirius right after having fought someone already. And injured. And injured, right? Such a dirty move. I know. And Harrow rises to the occasion. Yes. And takes the third challenge to the sixth. It's so principled. Mm -hmm. Why? Yeah, I love it. And I love Harrow's explanation. Yeah, the second is like, this is against the rules. And Sextus is like, you just proved that there are no rules. Mm -hmm. Like, you piece of shit. And like, you blew this thing wide open. This is, you did this, basically. And when when Harrow and Gideon step in to call for the six. Oh, yeah, they're like, since when is the ninth and the sixth been so tight? And... Harrow's like, we're not, but death first to vultures and scavengers. Woo! Hells yeah. Make me a t-shirt. Ooh. Right? That's a great idea. Death first to vultures and scavengers. Let's make t-shirts. I don't think that's an original idea. I'm sure that there's a t-shirt out there. We'll Google it. (laughs) (laughs) And then the fourth jumps in and is like, and after you fight Gideon, you're going to fight us. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> which I thought was cute. And then Nibirius <laughs> rolls his eyes. Yeah, just like backs down? Gives up. God, he's such a coward. I should have stayed home and gotten married. <laughs> Not like anyone was even offering. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, it's over quick. <laughs> and then... Silas Dr. Kuzeron is like, if you guys are done squabbling, I guess we should go and like find out where Protesilaus is. And <laughs> he like really throws out, I will say this for Silas, he's super good at insults. Yeah. I feel like Silas is a smart asshole. For sure. He's a type. He's like that guy who like just has no concept of that he could ever be wrong completely self-righteous like a lot of men but he's arguably like a sociopath oh yeah who thinks he's not but he is Mm -hmm. and he's hiding it or he's using this like sort of cover of religion as like justification for his shittiness which is classic Hmm. sounds familiar Mm -hmm. sounds familiar i had a question about 
this dis from Octa Kizaran to Sextus. Mm -hmm. He says, the warden of the sixth house is an unfinished inbred who passed an examination. Your companion is a mad dog, and I doubt her legal claim to the title of Cavalier Primary. What is he talking about, an unfinished inbred? Do you know Sextus's backstory? So there's a couple things. I believe that the sixth house has like rules ag against marrying outside of the house. So it's like everyone's like kind of related. In fact, I think that Camilla is his cousin or second cousin or something. And I think that's basically a diss on the, I'm sure, what is the stereotype of the sixth house not marrying outside of the house. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I don't understand the legal claim to the title of Cavalier primary thing, but whatever. Yeah, because we learn later that Camilla applied to be Sextus's Cavalier when she was 12 years old. Yeah. So I don't know where what Silas is talking about here, if he's just talking out of his ass, but... He's talking out of his ass a little. Yeah. But this is really where lines are drawn. You know, the ninth, the sixth, and the fourth get together. They talk about keys, and then they split up to look for Protessa Lawis. Everyone else kind of goes off on their own. Yeah. This is also, I think, the first time that the Mega Theorem comes up. The Mega Theorem. <laughs> it's huge. That's big. Yeah. And basically... Via Palamides explaining all of this to Isaac and Jean Marie, it's like laid out for us what keys are in play, more or less. I think at this point, eight keys accounted for, and there's one key that they're trying to figure out who has it. Well, it'd be seven keys, right? Because there are eight challenges in all. I thought there were nine keys, or nine keys for the nine houses. Well, the first house doesn't have a key, I thought. Oh, maybe though. It doesn't really matter, right? There's a certain number of keys, and there's only one key that it's not accounted for. Later, we find out that this is the key that Kitharea hid inside of Abigail, which is fucked. But that's why they can't find it, is because it's like literally in Abigail's hip or something ridiculous. Yeah, I think you made a note here that it's just because she didn't really have time to like sweep the place mm -hmm. but i don't know why this specific room i can't remember what's in the room at this point so i think that this key that the missing key that is in abigail is the key that opens up so later in this in this section we're going to talk about harrow siphoning gideon in order to pull some like gunk out of a keyhole but they don't have the key and I'm pretty sure that that room is the room that eventually the third house opens. They cut open Abigail. They find that key. They go to the to the door that Palamides and Harrow and Gideon had taken this gunk out of and use that, like the Abigail key, to open that door. The door opens into like a bedroom. And you know what's funny is that I always thought it was God's bedroom, but I don't think that's right. I think maybe it's Kitharea's bedroom. Maybe. But I think that's the door. The door that she doesn't want people to go into. Is her room. Well, I'm not sure whose room it is, but it's the same door that Gideon and Harrow removed the gunk from. And it's the same door that the third opens with the key that Abigail won before being killed right well tbd when we get there mm -hmm. yeah we will answer that question <laughs> one of my favorite lines in this chapter is when sextus is trying to make an analogy and refers to like well you know when you read how to like do sword fighting or whatever and then you practice it or something he's basically trying to explain his mega theorem idea and why it's right. Mm -hmm. And everyone looks at him like the six learn sword fighting from a book. Like he's just so nerdy. He's so nerdy and so <laughs> endearing. And he also admits when he's wrong, he was like, all right, I guess that was the wrong analogy. Yeah. It's just, he's such a like perfect character. I, I just love him. I know. I want to be friends with him. I love the nerds, and so I have a soft spot, <laughs> soft spot for him. I know it. He also 
tells Harrow that he trusts her. And that was a cool moment. I know. And the and hearing it from Gideon's perspective where Gideon's like watching Harrow and is like, no one else would notice this, but Harrow <laughs> is going through like a whole like series of emotions as she listens to Pal say that he trusts her. <laughs> I think it's something like went from like dark mystique to cryptique mystique <laughs> like <laughs> yeah. super funny uh, and then pal is like well gideon what do you think about all of this and gideon like doesn't say anything for a little bit and is thinking and thinking and you think that she's going to say something intelligent but instead she says do you know if you take the First three letters of your last name with the first three letters of your first name, you get sex pal. <laughs> <laughs> is that a reference to something or is I that just know. like a like a weird bad joke? <laughs> it's the worst joke. I think I think it's like the worst joke in these books. Like it's it's so stupid. <laughs> I mean, I crack up every time. <laughs> It's so stupid, and it's, like, out of nowhere. <laughs> just like, what? <laughs> Gideon amply demonstrates that, you know, her brains are in her biceps. Yep, and in her heart. And that's okay. And so they split up, basically. And what's interesting is that Palamides suggests that Camilla, him, and Harrow go down into the facility and that Gideon, Isaac, and Jean-Marie stay up with Dulcinea mm-hmm. to keep an eye on her. Mm-hmm. And Harrow says no, that it should be flipped, that Harrow, Palamides, and Camilla will stay with Dulcinea and Gideon, Isaac, and Jean-Marie go down to the facility. Mm-hmm. And we learn later that this is because Harrow does not trust Dulcinea and doesn't want Gideon near her because she has just offed Protesilaus and mm-hmm. confirmed that he was a puppet, but doesn't quite know what or why that's happening. Mm-hmm. She doesn't trust Palamides either at this point, I think. Right. I mean, Hera doesn't really trust anyone, mm-hmm. but there are different, there's a spectrum of distrust, and yeah. Dulcinea is at the top. Mm-hmm. And I just think Harrow handles this moment really well where she says no to Palamides, suggests this other configuration, and says it's because she doesn't trust going down to the facility with Camilla. (laughs) Yeah. And it's just like this like quick little pseudo lie. And you don't, you know, again, when you just read it for the first time, you don't really think anything of it. But this is Harrow protecting Gideon. Yeah, or she thinks she is, yeah. She thinks she's protecting Gideon. Mm -hmm. And so Gideon, Isaac, and Jean-Marie go down into the facility and chaos ensues. Yeah, so they go into the facility looking for Protesilaus. Isaac and Jean-Marie are freaking out. They're super on edge. They keep on saying that they hear something. Isaac says something really interesting. He says, bodies were brought into here a long time ago, a lot of bone matter. The first feels like a graveyard all over. And I I don't really know what exactly this is referring to, but I think it has a lot. It's similar to like when they were first getting to the planet and Hera was like, yeah. this planet is a grave. Mm-hmm. They can sense that fan energy. Mm-hmm. So unfortunately, immediately after this, a giant bone construct appears. Those like thunk, thunk, thunk lights, they all thunk out. Oh my God. I hate to think of it. This is so horror. I know. This is th- one of the most horror chapters in the book. Yeah, for sure. It's so intense. It's super cursed. And this giant bone construct appears very quickly, kills Isaac. Somehow, Gideon grabs Jean Marie and pulls her out and out of the facility up the ladder and through the hatch. I don't know how. Well, she's the daughter of God. It's true. (laughs) That's how. It's the only explanation for why that was possible. I love that we, at the very beginning of this podcast, we were like, we won't be too spoilery. (laughs) (laughs) A massive spoilers. For some reason, 
Okay, first of all, like I understand Kitharea's main goal, which is to like lure John to the first house. And in order to do that, she wants to kind of be like slowly killing off all of the, you know, applicants to Lichterhood, as it were. But she could kill these people in any way. And what she does is that she makes this giant bone construct, <laughs> writes like death to the fourth house on the wall, and like spears them through. Like, I don't understand why it needs to be like so flashy. It does. It's so extra. It is. Kitharae is so extra in how she kills people off. And I think it could be to really throw them off her path. You know, no one could imagine that Dulcinea would have the strength to pull that shit off. I mean, a giant bone construct seems so far away from what would be possible for Dulcinea in her current state. And so it really, you know, when the reader is going through this, even if you have some idea like Harrow that Dulcinea isn't, there's something going on with Dulcinea. It had never crossed my mind that she was responsible for these really intense ways that people died. It was just Mm -hmm. so far from the character she was portraying. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of get it in that sense. I don't get the blood on the wall of death to the fourth house, and I don't get sweet dreams unless those are references to something that I'm just not picking up on. It might be like she wants Gideon to see it so that Gideon will, like, take this back to everyone else and everyone will be super freaked out, which, I mean, it works. <laughs> but, yeah, it's it's pretty cursed. <laughs> yeah. I think also she, like, it, she's definitely playing into this fear that they have that there's, like, a monster in the facility. Definitely. But then she kills Jean-Marie. Okay, so then Gideon takes Jean-Marie to X203, that first Lichter room, the the Gideon and Piers room. Yes. They both go to sleep, which I don't really understand. And Gideon wakes up like 15 minutes later and Jean-Marie has been killed. And Sweet Dreams has been written in Jean-Marie's blood on the wall, which is, (laughs) jeez. So this, like, I I feel like I would think that she was just, that Kitharea was just trying to make them feel like it was all the facility. But no, then she kills Jean-Marie like in... She kills her upstairs. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, this is like when shit really hits the fan. And, you know, I when I even rereading it through the second time, I still had this question around why wasn't Gideon killed in that room? Because yeah. clearly she could have been killed easily. Well, who knows? Maybe not easily. Maybe she wouldn't have been killed by that construct. But, you know, a kind of a far-fetched theory would be that she did try and kill Gideon and it just straight up didn't work because Gideon has got blood in her. (laughs) So that's like one far-fetched theory. But I think the other probably more realistic theory, and you, there's a quote from Kitharea to Gideon during that epic fight towards Mm -hmm. the end of the book where she says to Gideon, cry mercy, please, you don't even know what you are to me. You're not going to die here, Gideon, and if you ask me to let you live, you might not have to die at all. I've spared you before. And I'm, you know, Dulcinea is, or Kitharea is referring to all these times that she could have killed Gideon throughout, you Mm -hmm. know, the whole book and doesn't. And I really think it's this complicated internal fight she's having with herself that all the lictors are having with themselves around their love and devotion to god Mm -hmm. and also knowing that he is evil and they need to end him and the houses and necromancy and it's heartbreaking and so i think that kitharea sees all, all like gideon is a representation of all of that And so can't bring herself to kill Gideon, even though it does seem throughout that fight that she's really trying to kill Gideon. So it's confusing. Yeah, she even like comes out of the sick room and is like, 
I am the lictor, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to kill totally. everyone. And this begins with you. <laughs> but then she right. like, really changes right. her tune. <laughs> he change, she changes it up. And and I mean, I guess, you know, Kithere has been acting this whole time. So you also don't know what is real and what's not. But right. what we do know for sure is that at one point she was devoted to God. And at one point she realized the truth was radicalized. And that shit comes with a lot of baggage, man. <laughs> you follow one dude for like almost 10,000 years and then you realize that it's all fucked. I mean, you're going to have you're going to have to go to therapy. And that doesn't sound like it's an option for these lictors. Yeah, they really should have lictor therapists. <laughs> yeah. Kithere also like I don't want to like play armchair psychologist but like definitely she has some issues yeah well (laughs) if you lived for (laughs) ten thousand years i think you would have some issues (laughs) she's unwell like sometimes i like i i i forget that part of this might just be that she's a little bit out of it like you know she's not making logical decisions because you know she's been around for a long time and is deeply traumatized by like basically a lifetime of dying (laughs) <laughs> Indeed. So. Indeed. And so just to like close out the 25th chapter, we do learn a little bit about the fourth house. You know, when Jean-Marie is in is grieving and is talking to Gideon a little bit about her history with Isaac mm-hmm. and they get to know each other a little bit. And we we learn that the fourth house is made for the front lines. It's a super bleak existence and i think at one point she even says they have so many siblings because they need spares yeah brutal (laughs) and i think you know again this just adds to the fact that all the houses in this system have their really shitty aspects Mm -hmm. and we know the ninth is a horrible place and you just see folks existence throughout the universe and it's not it's not great yeah glad i'm not in the fourth house we we should take a quiz mel at some point and figure out what house we're in have you taken one no <laughs> does one exist i'm sure we'll find it we'll get back to you guys <laughs> <laughs> so we move into chapter 26 gideon's basically in shock because i mean duh the fourth was just like killed in front of her especially the jean marie thing like that's messed up yeah and she is kind of like zoned out and a bunch of people are talking to her the only thing she really hears is when harrow is kind of haranguing her for this and all she's really hearing from harrow is you're an idiot you messed up which later on we learn is harrow is freaked out and is worried for gideon and is taking this emotion and basically projecting it (laughs) and just like upset that Gideon put herself in danger she's not blaming Gideon for the deaths of the fourth house well it's part of Harrow's pattern where her worry translates into verbal abuse yeah in a lot of ways Mm -hmm. you know and again when we get to the next several chapters it's coming there's a reason why right it's her inner child as we know Mm -hmm. and that's just how she shows that she cares and she's worried and it's not healthy and it doesn't mean it's right but we can humanize her in those moments yeah for sure so gideon is in shock and the way she deals with this is she goes and hangs out with dulcinea slash kitharea who presumably this whole time was like hanging out with palamides and camilla and harrow who were quote-unquote guarding her while remotely piloting this huge ass bone construct bananas or i mean maybe she like gives it directions and it but whatever i mean she's she's just hanging out there half dead most of the way dead but unable to die and puppeting this huge construct so yeah and i found that this conversation that Gideon and Kitharea have together, I find it to be a really beautiful, really beautiful prose. Mm-hmm. I think the writing is really beautiful. And 
the wisdom and the philosophy in it is also really well done. And it makes sense the way that Kithere is talking about death and life. It makes so much sense that this is her worldview coming from someone who has lived for 10,000 years. Mm -hmm. And talking about our mortality and what it means to be alive, a lot of the time we talk about how death makes life worth living. Mm -hmm. And that has been taken away from these lictors. They can't die, at least not easily. And so just imagining, you know, Gideon is so upset about everyone who has died so far in the way in which they have died. And Kithere has been alive for 10,000 years. She's seen a lot of death. And she's also dying from the inside out, Mm -hmm. just on and on and on. And I just find that the conversation she has with Gideon here is another clue into her real feelings, one part of her real feelings for Gideon in this moment. There's clear love here. Why would Kithere offer this? to Gideon if she didn't genuinely feel something towards her. Totally. And she talks about, you know, how life is a tragedy. And once someone dies, their spirits are free forever, which actually we learn later that's not quite true. And she talks about how, well, you know, they sometimes come back, but that that's an exception to the rule. And it shows their mastery of us and that they only come when we beg. And that once someone dies, we can't grasp at them anymore, thank God, except for one person, and he's very far from here. Yeah, John. Gideon, don't be sorry for the dead. I think death must be an absolute triumph. And I don't know, I just I just thought that was really beautiful and sad. It's funny, too, because <laughs> it is sad, because I also think that she's definitely thinking about Love Day, her cavalier, mm. and she's saying all this, but... In a way, it's not quite true for her cavalier because her cavalier's soul is like burning in her and she's able to grasp it all the time. But it's different than like the actual person. You know, she's not able to have that person in her life anymore, but she's continuously burning her and burning her and burning her as her power source. Right. So it's weird because she is grasping one specific person constantly right to like power her lichterhood right and then we get to the good stuff where dulcinea slash kitherea calls gideon out for not knowing the phrase one flesh one end yeah oh wait really quick though i want to point out because i i want someone to explain this to me and i i like just don't get it i have no answers i just have the question Kitherea in this part talks about her upbringing on the seventh house. As far as I can tell, all of the other houses were made by like a specific lictor. So each lictor founded a house. But the exception seems to be Kitherea, who did not found the seventh house. So I don't know where the seventh house came from. That's it. How did just someone, if anyone can explain to me the Kitherea timeline, I would love to hear it because I'm very confused. <laughs> Yeah, that's it. Okay. Yeah, I have I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. And I would like to know. So yeah, so this bit where Dulcinea calls Gideon out for not knowing the one flesh one in thing. The way that we learned this phrase is from that piece of paper. Yeah. That Gideon and Harrow found in the Lichter laboratory. And now we're learning that it's actually a totally common phrase, almost like a marriage vow. Like an I do, but it's said between cavaliers and necromancers, which is pretty intense. What I like about this realization, it reminds me of how in the Bible, like so many of the phrases that we use today don't actually mean what they meant when they were originally written. Mm -hmm. And so much of that is true in what's written in the Bible, what's written in like old works that then get turned into just everyday things that we don't even think about. And similarly with one flesh, one end, in lictorhood, it literally means one flesh, one end, the joining of these two beings. And with the necromancer and the cavalier in this modern day world, they don't even know what one flesh, one end actually meant when it was originally 
written. Right. It's like more of an abstract. Yeah. Also, there's that funny bit in, I think it's the appendix where they're talking about, in Harrow, I believe, where they're talking about how Augustine's brother and then Mercy Morn's cavalier, that phrase was made up by these two cavaliers who were like some of the original cavaliers to the the people who are now lictors. And there's like a note in the appendix where someone's making fun of one flesh, one end, because it sounds like a sex toy. <laughs> Do you, did you read that a bit? I did, but wow, I didn't remember that. Yeah, it's pretty funny. Anyway, <laughs> moving right along, there's a super awkward moment with Palamides, which I feel like we've all experienced. You're like flirting with someone and then another person you know who likes the same person you're flirting with approaches and it's like that awkward, oh shit. We know that you know that I know that we both like this person. So Palamity shows up, Gideon completely freaks out, is super awkward, and runs away. <laughs> <laughs> and runs into the eighth house. Oof. And there are more super good insults. Yeah, this is this was a, an, an unexpected encounter. Mm. I This came out of nowhere for me. And I think Gideon obviously was really shocked by this encounter too. Right. Silas invites her to come have tea with him in their quarters and Gideon's like, no, and like leaves and signs off with the incredible <laughs> eat me, milkman. <laughs> yes. Oh, it's so good. And then I think Colm is like, I think that likely means yes. <laughs> I know. It's so dumb. Um, but <sighs> what's crazy about this is that Octokizaron calls Gideon a servant in like 13 different ways <laughs> yeah. and basically basically like tells Gideon hey I know that you're not who you say you are I know that you weren't technically the cavalier mm -hmm. and Gideon's like what the hell and we remember that Glorica who was the mom of Ortis was from the eighth house and when they went on that shuttle they were supposedly heading back home to the eighth house or they thought they were and so at this point in the story we assume that octokizaron talked to glorica before he left to come to the first house and that glorica told him hey fyi this servant is the cavalier for the ninth house they're not who they say they are right and you know we learn in Chapter 28, which we will get to, that in fact, Octokizaron talked to Glorica because Glorica died because their shuttle got blown up. <laughs> yeah. And there's this moment that can happen where when you die, your soul who has maybe some like ties still to like living beings can come back and visit someone and just like be like, hey, by the way, this. Mm hmm. Before they like really die, and that's what that's what happened. Yeah, our first revenant. But this is not. They do not have that conversation now. They just Gideon finds out that he was talking to Glorica, but she says, "Eat me, milkman," and leaves. And then we have a really short little bit where basically Gideon is having these really bad dreams, predictably about Magnus and Abigail and John Marie and Isaac, and is kind of unable to stop having these awful nightmares. And then wakes up, or then has another nightmare where she's not sure if it's a dream or if it's real. I think it is real. Where she she wakes up and Harrow is sitting next to her without her makeup on, wrapped in a duvet, just watching her and is like, it's just me, go back to sleep. And it describes Harrow's look in that moment and says it could almost be pity or understanding, I think. And that totally makes sense because I think Harrow sees in Gideon the same self-hatred and self-blame for causing the death of other people mm. that she feels mm -hmm. in many ways totally gets how Gideon is feeling right now and feels a lot of pity mm -hmm. and sadness about it. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. So then we take a, I feel like this was kind of a jarring transition, honestly, into chapter 27. All of a sudden we just jump to Gideon and Harrow are in Palamides and Camilla's quarters and they're talking about their theories and about teaming up and, like, exchanging keys. Yep. 
And there's some fun little tidbits in here around kind of the sixth house that there are windows in the room, but they're totally covered. And and I was curious, Amy, if this was where you thought the hint for the sixth house being Mercury was, because they say that they are crowded up on the poles of this planet Mm -hmm. and there's no windows or anything because they're so close to just being melted by Dominicus. And so, like, because Pal and Cam are used to not having any windows to keep the temperature at the appropriate level on their home planet, they have all the windows shut and blinded here. Yeah, I think this is one of several clues. I think that the six is one of the only houses that I'm pretty damn sure. Like, I know it's Mercury. I just had to, like, sing the song in my head. Mercury, Venus, Earth, and, you know. Yeah, they're Mercury. (laughs) By this point, I think I had an idea that this was our solar system. Yeah. I was really confused because I didn't understand if Camilla did sleep on that weird cot or not. (laughs) But I think it, it does confirm later that she does sleep on that weird cot. Yeah, I think she does. I don't know if she sleeps among all of her weapons or not. (laughs) <laughs> I know. I was like, wait, is this saying that she does sleep there because her weapons are there or she doesn't sleep there because her weapons are there? I think she does. I think she does sleep there. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Plamney thinks that all of these challenges are building up to like a mega theorem and Harrow thinks that they're all clues that are going to lead to a secret hidden source of Thanergy, which is claimable prize. And Palamides is right, but also Harrow is kind of right because the Mega Theorem is is basically fueled by a continuous source of Thanergy, which is the soul of the Cavalier. I'm just trying to give Harrow some credit, (laughs) but Palamides is totally right. (laughs) (laughs) Palamides is totally right. And he also, he doesn't fully have the puzzle together. He knows there's, but I I do think he gets to a point where he's like, well, this is my theory. And so if, and they're talking about how unsustainable basically Mm -hmm. all of this is, which is why Harrow thinks that it's leading to this perpetual power source Mm -hmm. because the level of death energy that is required for all of this is unsustainable right we saw that Gideon basically almost died when Harrow just did that one challenge Mm -hmm. and so they're both like this is totally unsustainable I don't know how this fits together and I think even Palamides says actually it's wrong there's a flaw in the underlying logic the whole thing is an ugly mistake and I don't know if in that moment he figures it out or I think he suspects like I think he's kind of like well it could be that you burn the soul of someone but like that's so messed up that I can't even consider it totally but then it's also like later he hints that he's he's been he's been figuring out perfect lichterhood that doesn't kill the cavalier so I think maybe in this moment he's still thinking that he might be suspecting what did happen, but then as he continues to work on it, I think he kind of goes the way that Anastasia did, where he starts to figure out John's way of lichterhood. Mm. We also learn here, Harrow says that they only have access to 30% of Canaan House, which is not much. So Yeah, weird. And then <laughs> Harrow and Palamides agree to work together. There's a really funny line that always cracks me up, where Palamides is like, all right, are you in? And the next line is like, as everyone had already known beforehand, Gideon's necromancer was forced to admit that she was in. (laughs) (sighs) You made a note here about a meme alert. There's a meme alert. I found it. It's a really great line where basically Harrow's kind of like complaining about this deal that they're making. Like, I'm just not going to give everything over to you and... Palamides is like, this is a really good deal. Most people would think that. And, you know, then they get to the point where they agree, all right, let's go. And Palamides says, come with me for the cold, hard facts. And they all traipsed after him for the cold, hard facts. That's a meme. And it originated with The Office with Dwight. And I can't remember what episode, but there's all sorts of memes out there that are really funny that are the cold, hard facts. So I was pretty proud of myself for finding that one. 
I'm not that good at finding the memes. Yeah, that was good. I just rewatched The Office, but I totally did not catch that one. Yeah. In my millions of readings <laughs> of this book. <laughs> and so, you know, when they go off and follow Palamides for the cold hard facts, they mm-hmm. head to pick the lock on a lictoral door. And on the way, we get a great combo between Gideon and Cam. Oh, I know. They're like definitely like two people who would be such buds, you know? (laughs) They're bros. They kind of remind me of you and me when we were 22 or 24. I know. (laughs) 100%. Who's Gideon? Who's Cam? (laughs) Impossible. We're both Gideon. (laughs) Yeah, I don't think either of us are cool enough to be Cam. No. (laughs) (laughs) I'm less ripped than Gideon. I don't know. I don't know about you, but. I mean, so is everyone. (laughs) That's true. That's true. Anyway, it's a cute combo. And I love Gideon's like, ask me how I am and I'll scream. And Camilla's like, how are you? (laughs) And Gideon's like, I don't appreciate you calling me out on my bluff or whatever, because obviously she doesn't scream. But it's just a really cute back and forth. And Cam kind of asks Gideon about like why she's acting like her and Palamides are fighting Mm -hmm. and Gideon's basically like I don't I can't remember but it's about Dulcinea and Gideon's like just tell him if he wants an introduction to Dulcinea I can give it to him which is funny because we know that Palamides has been writing the real Dulcinea for years and Gideon doesn't know that and Cam says to her the last thing the warden needs is an introduction so again, we just get another clue that technically Palamides knows Dulcinea, even though we continue to hear from the Kitharea Dulcinea that she doesn't know him at all. Right. So they arrive at this door, which is under this picture, which I'm like, I have no way of knowing, and but I wonder if it's based on an actual picture. It's a picture of a canyon. Hmm. It'd be interesting if it, I mean, just because it's described, it would be interesting if it's actually like a painting that mm. we would be familiar mm. with or like a place. I was like, is it the Grand Canyon? And I was like, no, she's from New Zealand. Yeah. <laughs> wow. How how US centric of you. I know. <laughs> they don't have canyons anywhere else. <laughs> So this door has a lock, but the lock is like gummed up with this like regenerating ash. And Palamides is like, oh, I just wanted you to confirm that this is regenerating ash and is ready to go. And Hera's like, I can get rid of this. And in fact, sexist, I'm embarrassed for you that you can't. I love, I loved that. Yeah. Oh, no. But it turns out <laughs> Harrow can't yeah, either. <laughs> which is even better. So embarrassing. Immediately can't. But Gideon's like, Saddle up, sunshine. <laughs> yes, I believe. Up, and Harrow's like, if you say that again, <laughs> I'm going to kill you. Yeah. But basically, Harrow ends up siphoning Gideon in order to remove this gunk from this lock and succeeds. And Sextus is like not super impressed. He's like, This is not good morals. It's not good theory and it's not good morals. Yeah, in fact, he says, don't get used to using her that way. Ugh, another reason why I love him. I think Palamides is like a little bit, he's like suspicious. So they they ungun the lock. They talk a little bit more about the keys and who has what. And they talk about the third house. There's that funny line where Sextus is like, (laughs) I don't know which one to look out for. And Harrow's like, the big one. Yeah. They're, they're the also same size. wrong. I mean, like mm-hmm. wrong, which is funny because I, you know, because we don't see Harrow's point of view from here, it does seem like mm-hmm. she has all the answers all the time, which is very much what she wants to put off. You know, she wants people mm-hmm. to think that of her. I just found Harrow being wrong here as re- a really humanizing moment. That's it's basically two humanizing moments of Harrow. The first with her saying, 
I'm embarrassed that you can't do this. And then she can't do it too, which is just so good. Mm -hmm. And then this like very confident assertion that Corona is the one to look out for when in fact ianthe has been a little skeevy, clever, Mm -hmm. and evil character this whole time. Yeah, and has been reverse engineering the literal process is so smart. So the sixth house leaves and... As they leave, Palamides turns back to Gideon, and they're still, like, in this weird not-fight-fight, and Palamides says, oh, take care of her, and Harrow realizes that he's talking about Dulcinea, and gets, like, super jelly, and tells Gideon that she can't see Dulcinea, is banned from Dulcinea's sick room, and Gideon's like, what the fuck? She's dying, like, you're being so weird and jealous about this. They get in this huge fight. And the dialogue, the writing is so good. It's so real. I'm like, oh my God, this is a very real fight. (laughs) Have you ever tried to write dialogue? I struggle with it. (laughs) No, I've never tried to write, period. (laughs) I think the... (laughs) I wish I had the patience for that. I love to read other people's writing. I could never write well. I'm mm-hmm. not a writer. I'm a reader. Well, I mean, that's what we need for this, yeah. you know? But Tamsin Muir, she's a writer. Tamsin Muir's a writer. I mean, there's something so believable and visceral about this fight. Mm-hmm. It's so good. Every single, like, the ev- the dialogue is so good. The way that their, like, actions are described. Like, Harrow, like, puts on and takes off her gloves, like, three times. And it's like looking at her fingernails, like trying to look bored. <sighs> so good. The description of the feelings that Gideon has, that kind of hot burning sensation in your chest when you're really angry. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I can almost feel exactly what Gideon's feeling right now. Totally. And Harrow knows that this way of being is infuriating mm-hmm. to Gideon. Right. This looking bored, like... When one person in a fight is explosive Mm -hmm. and the other one is so calm, matter of fact, and quote unquote, appears to be handling it much better than you, as the person Mm -hmm. exploding, it is even more infuriating to be in that fight. Totally. I can can just feel it. (laughs) I can feel it so hard. I know. Ugh. Remember in the first episode when we were talking about how... Harrow says, like, I don't remember about you most of the time, and that that's, like, actually the cruelest thing she says. Mm -hmm. She says it again here, Mm -hmm. and it's totally untrue, but also such a, like, she knows, like, this is the worst thing that she could say. I don't even, I still don't even remember about you half the time. Mm -hmm. Oof. Oof. (sighs) Oh, my God. I just saw your note about, oh, take a nap. I didn't think about it as, like, Gideon took a nap and John marie got. That's. But Killed. that's what it that's what it was referring to. I mean, when when Harris says, Oh, just take a nap, Gideon loses her shit. Oh yeah. And she's like, I didn't mean for yeah. Jean Marie to die. And that's like the one time Harrow gets flustered and is like, I didn't mean and it's too late. Yeah. Like Gideon's like, fuck you. Yeah. That's where we should probably wrap it up for the summary and the the book for today but i did want to mention we got a a really interesting comment on the website that i wanted to talk about and it's about something that we don't know neither of us know much about but this was a note from rowan rowan thanks for writing in so rowan pointed out that tamsin muir was really influenced by homestuck when she was writing these books Homestuck, if I am correct, is like a webcomic that had like a very, very dedicated fan base, has a very dedicated fan base, and like a lot of fan fiction was written about it. Tamsin Muir wrote a lot of fan fiction. A lot of her writing is influenced by that webcomic and like the community around it. And I believe that like a lot of the dynamics between like the characters are kind of influenced by some of the dynamics in this in this world from Homestuck. Also, Rowan pointed out that Gideon's sunglasses are an homage to the character Dave Strider from Homestuck. And also, um, maybe that John has some similarities to John Egbert in Homestuck. Again, I don't really know these characters in Homestuck because I've never read it, but 
I totally buy it because I know that Tamsin Muir was super, super involved in the community and like a big stan of Homestuck. So if anyone has other connections to Homestuck that you want to uh, share with us, we would love to learn more because it's totally, I mean, I, I don't think we're going to go b- and read all of Homestuck, but I would love to have more insight into this because it seems like totally wild. I've seen a lot of fan art and like read some of Tamsin Muir's fan fiction around that universe and it is super interesting and I can totally see how she was influenced by this. So thank you so much, Rowan, for pointing that out. Definitely send more parallels and influences as you find them. And then there were both Rowan and another person wrote in about the prequel short story, The Mysterious Study of Dr. Sex, which I think... Oh, did you read it? I haven't read it yet. I'm trying to save something new for me. I... You know, but I think that I'm curious, Amy, when we might talk about that more explicitly. When would it make sense for me to read? I think that we should talk about that short story in between Gideon and Harold. Okay, great. Yeah. And we will do that, y'all. We will talk about more explicitly the mysterious study of Dr. Sex. Amy has brought it up here and there. But in our interlude between the two books, we will spend some time with it. Sweet. Well, I think we should wrap it up here for today. Thank you guys so much for joining us. If you liked listening, as always, please rate and review us wherever you're listening to this podcast. And then we would love to get more questions or comments or anything you want to point out. It's been so fun to to read what you guys have had to say. It makes us feel like we're not the only like completely <laughs> wacky nerds out there who are like obsessed with this book. <sighs> so thank you guys so much. Our website is LockedTombPod.com and our Twitter is at LockedTombPod. Also, shout out to Olivia K. My friend who wrote our theme music. Thanks, Olivia. I'm Amy. And I'm Mel. And we'll see you next time here at the Locked Tomb Podcast.